good morning. I don't know about you, I, I woke up with, a, with an excitement, with an anticipation. Are you hungry for God's word this morning? The fact that God promises to meet us when we gather together in an incredible, even supernatural way, because we are his living temple, okay? Awesome. It's exciting. Listen, we've covered a lot of ground over the last uh, several weeks in Acts chapter 2, okay? Turn back to Acts chapter 2. We've been covering a lot of ground, and I, I keep telling you, because the book of Acts is so very important as we piece our Bible together, all right? The Old Testament into the New Testament, uh, the book of Acts is the hinge, okay? And so I'm recapping a few things just to bring it through the forefront of your mind of all that's going on in Acts chapter 2. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we saw how, how uh, <clears throat> Jesus was the fulfillment of the, of the festivals of Passover and then the first fruits with his resurrection from the dead and now at Pentecost, the harvest celebration. That, isn't it amazing to see that for 1,500 years, God had planned a calendar and all of it was moving towards the culmination of the coming of his son, right? That God had promised that he would gather together those who were once scattered we also saw how Pentecost was the undoing of Babel, that God, in sending his spirit, he unifies language and culture in Jesus' name. And then last week, we saw how we become the temple of God, that no longer is God's presence in a temple in Jerusalem through animal sacrifice and Levitical priesthood. But because Jesus has entered the heavenly temple with his own blood and, and is presented as king and high priest enthroned, now you and I have God's spirit in us. Remember, wherever, whenever, and whomever. And we have the power to be his witnesses and to pray in Jesus' name, to come before God's throne in heaven in Jesus' name. All right, see, we've been covering a ton of ground, all right, so I hope you're excited to pick this back up and to continue through Peter's sermon, because I, I lopped it off, the, the first section. So remember where we are in your mind's eye, that... Uh, that a noise, violent rushing wind has caused when, when the Spirit fell on the 120 disciples in the upper room has caused, uh, let's say, 5,000 people to gather around because they heard the noise and they've come rushing to it. When they show up, they begin to hear those 120 disciples speaking in 15 plus languages. A miracle, the miracle of tongues right there at Pentecost. And then Peter stands up and addresses the crowd and quotes Joel 2 and tells them, listen, what you are seeing, what you saw in the heavens and the signs and wonders at Jesus' death, do you remember that when the moon rose blood red? What you saw and what you're seeing now, it's, it's the outpouring of the Spirit of God as prophesied more than 500 years ago in the book of Joel. Amen. All right, and now let's pick up Peter's sermon. So he's just quoted Joel. Now look at verse 22 of chapter 2. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. And then Peter, off memory, 
again quotes scripture, but this time he quotes Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. And the primary reason he's quoting there, look at verse 27. He quotes Psalm 16, written by David a thousand years prior, and look at verse 27. David writing, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And then Peter begins to apologetically address the crowd and say to them, listen, David is speaking prophetically here, okay? David is not writing about himself. Guys, David is dead. We we can go across town to his grave. David is dead. Whenever he said, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay, God had given him a promise, and David was writing about the coming Messiah, his descendant, because God had given him a promise of an eternal kingdom. David knew this a thousand years prior, that one of his descendants would rise from the dead. Then Peter says, and we've seen it. And we've seen it and his ascension. And then based on that little testimony, he quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. Look at verse uh, 34 and 35. And then the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. How is it that David says the Lord said to my Lord? How is it that David has two lords? It's the fact that he knows and understands that one of his descendants will come after him and will be his Lord and will rise from the dead. So pick up in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves uh, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, as we, as your people, whom you have called, because we have had your spirit open our eyes and prick our hearts and allow us to see, and we have gathered together this morning around your word to hear your voice. Father, allow us to see and to comprehend the gospel of Jesus Christ in a new, fresh, even powerful way. God, and call us to take this good news out, out into our city and out into our culture that you might save the lost And that you might use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Peter, a Galilean fisherman, has just delivered the greatest sermon in the history of the world. The greatest sermon ever preached. 3,000 Israelites in one convicting moment, place their faith in a crucified 
Messiah. I mean, against all expectation, in a hostile environment, the church is born. Now, there are two threads that Peter weaves all through this sermon. And the first of which is that this is and always has been God's plan. That God is not surprised. That God was not taken back. That God is not reacting to bad circumstance that happened to Jesus. But rather that God had predicted. That he had attested through his prophets for years. And even against this crowd's expectation that Jesus was his long-awaited Messiah. That David wrote Psalm 16 and Psalm 110 a thousand years prior. And now you can read it and you can see it with clarity that David was pointing towards the promised one that would come from his line. That, that an eternal kingdom was given to David, but it would come through an eternal king. That he would be raised from the dead. And Joel, 500 years prior, spoke of the signs and wonders surrounding Jesus' death. An earthquake. The fact that that night the, the moon rose blood red. Right there in Joel, that God had woven into the fabric and the orbits of the sun and the planets and everything, the coming and even the death of his son, attesting to, that God was attesting to his Messiah and the miracle of tongues that the crowd, the crowd now heard and could know with certainty that Jesus is enthroned in heaven, that he is king, and that God's spirit has been poured out. And Peter, throughout the entire sermon, beating it like a drum over and over and over again, that Jesus is the risen Messiah, that Jesus is the reigning king, that God is moving, that God is sovereign, and that his plans cannot, will not ever be thwarted. And then Peter turns to the crowd. He's been addressing the crowd, but he says, but you've been fighting against God. God has been moving, but you have been fighting against God. You see, God's sovereignty doesn't absolve the people from their responsibility. Right? With equal force. Peter presses their part, their responsibility. But you killed the Messiah. Look at verse 23. This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And then in case you missed it the first time, in a really short sermon, he circles back around in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, how's that for a close of a sermon? I mean, how does that compare to our typical sermons of, of our day in our PC culture, where we soften every phrase so that no one hurts their self-esteem? And Peter stands up to a crowd of, say, 5,000 of them and says, and you killed him. I mean, this could have ended really badly. It did for Stephen. This is, I mean, Stephen just took Peter's sermon, replayed it, and he got stoned. Because he presses their guilt and their responsibility of sin. 
he addresses it straight on and says, you've been fighting against the Son of God. But pause for a second and let's ask the question, how can Peter say this? I mean, this is 50 days later. There's, there's no way it could be the exact same crowd. I mean, let's say maybe a thousand of them could say, well, well, I wasn't there that day. I was at home. I was at my aunt's house. I didn't crucify him. Plus, you could easily say, well, well it, was, it was the leaders. It was the scribes and the Pharisees. It was the Sanhedrin. Or, or it was the Romans. How can Peter say, you crucified him? Because from a spiritual perspective, the Bible will say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That Jesus died for my sin. I put him there. Because I worship stuff and delight in stuff more than I do God. That I do not give thanks the way I ought to. That I do not love my neighbor as myself. That I exalt myself filled with selfishness that my sin put him there. The disciples abandoned him. The Jews cursed him and the Romans mocked him. And even Peter, who is preaching this very sermon, denied Jesus standing 40 feet away from him. How is it that Peter can say, you crucified him, when he denied him standing right there while he was on trial, while he was being mocked, while he was being punched, and Peter's like, I don't know him, calling down curses upon himself. No one, no one expected a crucified Messiah. It is solely the wisdom of God because man in his pride does not think he is ever that bad. It's why Peter, when Jesus tells him, right, Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then, and then <clears throat> Jesus says, yes, and I'm going to be crucified. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. You just said he was the son of God. And then you rebuke him. Why? Because no one thinks they need a crucified Messiah. God is my sin so bad that you needed to forsake your son and have him turned over to evil men who will mock him, strip him naked, and crucify him. Yes. Yes. Our sin is that bad and does separate us from God. Amen. And what I love about Peter's sermon and the Holy Spirit for that matter is that God loves you enough to tell you the truth. Amen. That your sin, your anger, your lust, your greed, your selfishness, even your doubt and your fear, it separates you from God. That the biggest problem of your life is your sin. That's the biggest problem in your life, is your sin. If it, if, if it was the government, 
then God would have sent his son to be a politician. If it was the economy, then God would have sent his son to be an entrepreneur. If it was health, then God would have sent his son to be a doctor. But God sent his son to be a crucified Messiah to become and to take on the full wrath and weight of our sin. And the good news, the reason it's called good news is because God loves you enough to tell you the truth. Have you ever thought, what if God didn't address our sin? What if he just looked at you and he told you, you know what? You're awesome. Like there's nothing wrong with you. You're absolutely perfect, magnificent, no problems. You're a complete masterpiece. Where does that leave you with your anger and your doubt? In your anxiety and fear, it leaves you hopeless. But he loves you enough to look directly at your sin and tell you the truth and say your sin is killing you. And the truth shall set you free. It's why Christians have come to sing lyrics like, it was my sin that held him there. Or, ashamed, I hear my mocking voice calling out amongst the scoffers. When Mel Gibson did his movie, The Passion of the Christ, there is There is only one scene that he is in in the entire movie. You may not know this. He insisted on being in one scene. It was his hands that drove the nails into Christ's wrists. It's why Christians, although not murderers, can see their own face when Barabbas is let free and Christ takes the punishment. You see, the good news begins with the truth. That is that you are in desperate need of some good news. Many years ago, I was preaching uh, a sermon to uh, a group of children. I was was a children's pastor many, many years ago. And it was a message that was actually similar to this one. And during that, I held up a picture of this painting. This painting is called Forgiven by Thomas Blackshear. Look at it for a second. There was a child in the, in the crowd named Peter who was the most rowdy, ADD, in trouble all the time, just rambunctious, and he was known all through the church. Oh, here comes Peter. And during the sermon, through the showing of that photo and through me describing the good news of the gospel, He got saved. And in the most, in one of the most incredible, tender moments that I've ever experienced, he he left my youth group and he ran to, uh, sorry, he left my children's group and he ran to the youth group where his older brother was. Now they were still having service, but he burst through the door and he began to shout, Jesus forgives me, even me. Even me. 
Secondly, what I want you to notice is the who of this revival. Because it's scandalous how gracious God is. It is scandalous. Jesus tells his disciples, go back to Jerusalem. The spirit must fall in Jerusalem. Go back to those who killed him. Now, certainly in this crowd were some of those, even many of those who cried out, we have no king but Caesar, or screamed, crucify him, crucify him, call for the release of Barabbas, a known murderer, and said, his blood shall be on our heads and on our children. You see, these are the very ones who are gathered by the sound of the violent rushing wind. The very ones who experienced the miracle of, of, of the tongues of Pentecost. And the very ones who hear Peter's first sermon. I mean, do you remember Joseph's story in Genesis? How he was sold into slavery by his brothers? And yet, whenever he resurfaces victorious and ruling on the other side. It is their evil, their very evil act that God uses to save them. And Joseph says, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. For your good. That their salvation was coming from their very own evil deed. And in the same way here at Pentecost, you know, God showed up and they crucified him. And then God showed up again, stares straight at their sin and offers hope, offers salvation. I mean, can you believe how humble God is to offer to the very same ones who killed his son Salvation. I mean, it's not like they spent the last 50 days in the temple in sackcloth and ashes going, what have we done? They aren't looking for him at all. And God shows up. Where were you when Christ found you? I was totally consumed with sports and girls and just trying to be cool. I wasn't looking for him at all. When a buddy of mine invited me to go to a church event and to see the power team, some ex-football players ripping phone books and Snapping baseball bats and telling kids about Jesus. It was the first time I heard the gospel. And he saved me. But could I even attest to you that I had no clue how to walk with him? And I was still all about sports and girls and being cool. But God in his patience and in his unrelenting love, he allowed my world to crumble so that I would cry out and turn and completely surrender to him. And I look back and I weep at the goodness, at the kindness, at the patience, at the grace of God, of someone who is slow of heart, Slow to learn, I was selfish in all that I did for myself. And he saved me. Where were you when God found you? You may be here this morning. And you may think, you know what? Today is that day. I have been running from Jesus. Jesus. 
I am dead in my sin. Listen, with everything inside of me, we look upon him. You can come to eternal life right now by surrendering in your heart and placing your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. This passion with which I preach, it overflows from the fact that I was completely unworthy. I am completely unworthy. We all are completely unworthy. But you can have eternal life. I want to share with you uh, an incredible illustration uh, from Chuck Swindoll talks about the church and how easily we can miss our calling or our ultimate purpose. It begins like this. On a dangerous seacoast, notorious for shipwrecks, there was a crude little life-saving station. Actually, it was only a little hut with one boat. But there were devoted crew members who, who were constantly looking out over the sea and they would, they would go out on rescue missions, working tirelessly into the night, searching for those in danger and they would find people and they would save those who were lost. And many, many lives were saved by this brave band of men. So much so that it began to become a famous place. Many of those who had been saved wanted to to pour back into that little life station and with their time, energy, and money. And soon they began to purchase new boats and new crews were trained. It didn't take long before many became unhappy with how unattractive that little hut was. It was it was poorly equipped. And so they began to provide for it, to make it a more comfortable place. And they began to put lovely furniture in there. And and then at some point, they began to buy so much stuff that 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 little hut needed to be torn down so you could build a new one to, to house all the additional equipment and furniture, all that was going on. It wasn't long before it became a popular gathering place, but its objectives began to shift. Now it began to be used as a clubhouse more for public gatherings. Saving lives and feeding the hungry and strengthening the fearful, all right, that that rarely occurred by now. Fewer members were actually interested in going out into the seas to rescue people, so they hired professional lifeboat crews to do that work. Now, it was about this time that a massive shipwreck occurred and the boat crews brought in those who were cold and wet and half drowned They were dirty, sick, and lonely. The beautiful new club suddenly became messy and cluttered. And so a special committee was put together, and they decided that we needed to put a a shower house that was outside, that was away from the club, so that the people could get cleaned up before they came inside the club. Now, at the next meeting, there were some strong, angry words and feelings surrounding some of the members. See, most of the people wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities altogether. It's just too unpleasant. It's too much of a hindrance to our social life. These people aren't really our kind. Well, as you could expect... Some people still wanted, even insisted upon saving lives, that that was their primary objective. So they, so they took it to a vote, and well, they lost. They were voted down. And those people were told, well, why don't you go do your own life-saving station down the street? So that's what they did. They built a new life station. But it wasn't long before that same life station experienced the same old changes and evolved into just another club. And if you visit the coast today, you'll find a large number of exclusive, very impressive clubs all along the shoreline. 
operated and owned by slick professionals who have lost all involvement with the saving of lives. Shipwrecks still occur. They still occur in those waters. But you see, most of the victims, they aren't saved. Every day they perish at sea, and so few seem to care. So very few. You see, the magnificence of the gospel is that we were all lost at sea, drowning in our own sin, and saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. May we never lose the wonder of the mercy of God. And may we never lose our mission and focus as a church. That, guys, everything we are to do is to reach a lost and dying world. Now, I want to quickly show you how this chapter ends as we close. Because 3,000 were saved that very day. 3,000 from all over the Roman Empire. 3,000 of the very sinners who killed Jesus. Verse 43. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. You see, they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to close this sermon with a challenge for you, church. My challenge is this week, would you pray with me every day this week? Would you set an alarm to pray with me this verse, verse 47, over our church, and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved? Would you cry out and would you say, God, I give you the freedom. I surrender. You can awaken me and use me however you want. Give me a passion to reach the lost. You can pray a minute. You can pray five minutes. You can pray 10 minutes. Would you pray with me this week that we as a church would never lose our focus, that we would have a passion to reach the lost, and that God would add to our number those who are being saved? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church crying out for the lost. Father, I know all across this room that, that there are, are those in each of our lives, God, that we hurt for, that we hunger to come to know you. Even, even many, God, that we have become discouraged over because it does not seem that they are going to come to faith in you. God, may this sermon and your scripture fill us with courage because if there is any group 
that it does not seem like they would come to faith in you. It would be those that killed you. And yet in your incredible humility, you went right back to them and offered salvation. And we can even hear our own voice in the crowd because where were we when you found us? Father, give us a passion.